So the machine learning dev device will decide, <coughs> let me go a few slides back, uh, back is what I want. So there is an output unit for protein, uh, for the center, the codes for the central residue being involved in a protein protein interaction, and one that is for the protein is not involved in an action, interaction. Let me go back to this issue where I show reliability here. Uh, and whenever this first unit is the highest, then you say it's an interaction, right? Again, you could also have done that by a single output unit. And how would you make then the decision? It's trivial. So in this particular case, I say whenever this unit is higher than that unit, it's P, it's, P, it's a protein-protein interaction. How would you do it with one unit? Um, 0 0.5 to so whenever the number is higher than 0 0.5, you say this is the protein-protein interaction. Now again, the advantage of using two units is you can learn some correlation between. It could be that in fact both features are somehow low or both features are somehow high. <laughs> and this is, uh, there are special cases and the network in principle can learn that. And that's the advantage of having two. Anyway, so now there's a default decision and again the default decision would be this unit is higher than that. By this default decision, these both would be decisions of equal value. Both would be predicted as protein interaction. This one, however, is a stronger prediction, right? And now, well, what I show you on this rock curve here, that's the first version of it, uh, when we used only sequence, is essentially we dial through this value. So we begin with a default and then we, we sort of increase. So we, we say we let only through the most accurate, the m strongest, the most reliable predictions, right? We put the threshold very high. We put the threshold very low, we let everything through, okay? Uh, and this is essentially what you see here. For some, when the coverage is low, for some, the accuracy is high. So those are the ones for which, in fact, the reliability index is relatively high. Those, so the left one here would be the more on the left side. And let me now jump again to the, to the curve where we, we see it a little bit more. So this is the one where you see a little bit more. So on the side toward higher accuracy are the ones with a higher reliability, right? And essentially to create this curve, you dial through the threshold and simply see how this curve evolves, right? Now, back to that question. Again, this was random here, this was sequence only, and that uses all the type of information that we used. The question to you, why could it be not quite meaningful for some users to use the area under the curve? Yeah? We don't have enough data. That is certainly always true, but uh, if you actually, what you say, would also invalidate me giving any other quote, right? Any other number. So any, your argument would be the end for any performance estimate. But that I would defend, or would, would put in, remember for the subcellular localization prediction, we had examples where the error rate was extremely high. So we had performance of 50% at an error rate of plus minus 50 or something like that, right? So my argument there was, so even if your data set is so small that you have such a high error rate, give the, the performance and tell the users, listen, you cannot trust it because I had a small data set. But there's still no point in not having performance estimate. So if you give a performance estimate, you need an error bar. I don't have error bars here. So this, this is one problem, uh, and I apologize for that. It's also true. That, uh, anyway, but that is not what I'm asking here. What is specific, again, area under the curve would compute the area under the blue curve, or the area under the random curve here would, yeah? The area under the curve would neglect that the performance is quite different for like the small part of the coverage where it's very good. And That's exactly the point. That's exactly the issue. There may be users who say, well, listen, I can do a limited number of experiments. Give me your most reliable predictions. I can test 10 or something like that. And I don't really care how many of the ones that I could possibly discover in human uh, 10 million I, I, you, you give me. What I really want is the 10 the highest, most reliable 10. And this very often, in fact, is a way of using it that for many applications, this is the most important thing, right? Uh, 
in, in some other applications, it may be most important to go on that side of the spectrum. So when you uh, try to see whether the images that you see imply that a cancer is going to come back or not. And the question is whether the person has to be treated before the relapse of the cancer, right? Then maybe what you want is a very, very high coverage. So you want to essentially find a point where you can be sure that whoever will have a relapse will have a treatment or will have essentially a recheck of the, the evolution of the cancer. So for different demands, you might really look at two different extreme parts of this, of this curve. And none of those two performances is reflected by AUC. So I believe here is the step of saying, whenever you look at these curves, think about what the user really wants. So put yourself into their shoes and don't sell, maybe when you do, and you end up doing data mining or something like that, maybe, yeah? So uh, when I read, read about the rock curve for, uh, for this binary classification, usually the random... Uh, yes, is, because is usually... How is the random here uh, defined? So, uh, the random here is, I, I, have to, I have to say I cannot remember exactly how we defined random. I believe what we did is we uh, took the same number of predictions and we, we, we randomly picked them. So in this one here, per protein I have 10 predictions, or for one particular protein I have 10 predictions. In fact, it differs between proteins, right? So one protein I have 10 predictions and now I randomly choose 10 others. Uh, or we, 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 we take the sides and we flip the, uh, the assignments. I can't remember which of these two ways we did it here, but I believe it's one of those. Uh, the different random models. Now, why is this not the diagonal story? Because that ultimately is the false positive ratio or the false positive number versus the true positives. Mm -hmm. And that is a different story. Here I really have Quotient, uh, quotients and for those random is no way in the middle. Absolutely not. Uh, I mean, in, it, it would be flipped, so it would be here. No, but it's not. Absolutely not. Um, okay. So, but back to to the issue. Uh, become aware, even if everybody in the field has used always AUCs, and there are tons of for, of examples in our field where that is the case. Whatever field you're going to go into tomorrow, maybe like that. Maybe there are 20 different publications. They all use something. Think it through uh, and discuss with the users who you will cater to and discuss it with yourself. Think this through. Find a way to present performance that is intuitive. These numbers mean something and you always have to give them for publications. But try to find an angle at which you see some other interpretation that is more reasonable or that, is, that at least reflects on the final goal from a different perspective. It's never easy, but be creative on that. Find some other ways that are somehow, at least for you and for the person you, you discuss with, more intuitive. Uh, and, we, and I said that so the ones that are very highly accurate, in fact, are the hotspots, so the most important uh, residues uh, in protein-protein interactions. And here again, I have such a coverage versus accuracy plot, same thing. Now, when, when we asked essentially what is the most important information, so this is the performance by using only a single feature, hydrophobic moment here, by using only sequence, by using only evolution, and then you see you do better and better and better the more you combine all these features. Okay. So now that brings us to the issue of hubs. Uh, now, proteins communicate with each other by interacting. You can call that communication. So for protein communication is an interaction. And that brings up the question, so we, we, we assume that all proteins, or almost all proteins in human, almost all 20,000 proteins in human will interact with some other protein. Now comes the question, will all proteins have a similar number of binding partners? So, will, if you look at a curve that gives you number of protein-protein interaction per protein and then gives you a histogram, right? What do you expect? Do you expect 
the f that would be the blue one here is every protein has essentially the same number of binding pi partners. Again, let's go back to this issue of you interacting with other students. So every student has this roughly the same number of friends or, or colleagues or uh, acquaintances, right? Or would we have a situation where, where some have very few and some have a lot? Or do we have some sort of Gaussian peak? where there is sort of a size of, of your friendship or the number of things a protein can bind that is best and then you have some Gaussian. What do you believe? Yeah? I would uh, guess the Gaussian distribution. The Gaussian distribution, because we have always seen Gaussian distributions. Uh, no, I'm thinking, I'm thinking if you're looking at the average the average sort of interaction per protein, then if you look at a large population, I think that the population will converge towards a part of distribution. So the real question that I that I have to really think about, about a little bit is what do I expect for this example of the students? And maybe that gives you this idea of a Gaussian, because we just have a limited number of possible interaction partners. But actually, you, you, from partners you know that some people go way beyond what you believe your limit is. Um, there are these party sharks, right? There are these people who can, they're not only party sharks, they're society sharks. They're, they're, they're people who just know, or shark maybe the wrong word, but there are people who, for who it is very, very easy to connect. Uh, so let's, let's try it differently here. Let's think about a different issue, completely different issue. Let me pose a different problem. If, if you looked at the settlements on this globe, then you immediately see that this clearly, or will it be a Gaussian? How do you believe this will look? So settlements includes anything that uh, is, I don't know, we, we start counting at 50. So any village that is populated by 50 people to the mega centers of the world, uh, Shanghai and the like. So actually Tokyo is still the biggest and do you guys know? Or is it Shanghai by now? Or is it some other city? Um, Mexico City. Mexico City, right? Yeah, but Shanghai is, is 28, so... Uh, but that is an old number, with the 28. Um, <laughs> I mean, so what does it say? What does Tokyo. It? Tokyo. Tokyo is still, is still mm -hmm. the largest. Then New York? Is no, New York is not sure. Sure. That is, that, then you looked at the wrong website. Uh, uh, Tokyo is also a problem because there is no city Tokyo. But um, so. so the histogram here is that each bin is like a certain size, and then we count the number of yes. segments. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I would say again that it's caution distribution. Really? No. No, that is not absolutely not a caution distribution. I would expect uh, kind of like a line like the green line, just yeah, in the other decreasing. That we have a lot more small settlements and then. So this uh, is this is a log line here, yeah. log log. It's a log log plot, uh, and that is from ninety one, the largest U.S. metropolitan areas from ninety one, as I said, uh, and you see pretty much. This one over Z, uh, the so-called Zip flaw. And Zip, in fact, he invented this one over X. So he invented this for the for word counts. So asking which letter is most often used in in the German or English alphabet. So he studied an American uh, scholar who who spent some time in Germany and and tried to see can I distinguish by by this simple count whether I in front of me have a German or an English text. It is simple, and with that he did that already in the 30s. Uh, and according to the zip flaw, that essentially looks like this. Now. The interesting reality is anything that evolves on its own in competition will follow that law. All you need is the assumption of competition. You can play with it in a computer. You can create your own, your own world. Uh, so settlement is an example. Sizes of bridges, sizes of streets, uh, traffic in streets, what, what, whatever you can think about. Anything that somehow evolves under competition will follow ultimately so competition means there is an advantage of, of uh, getting somewhere. Um, we'll follow this zip flow. Uh, and then, in fact, 
this also implies that protein protein interactions uh, will will follow as it yeah but this line is not like exactly having the number it's more having like at least Number. So if you look no, that is exactly so. This so this is one particular zip flow, right? Now there are parameters. So the uh, you put in, uh, it, it's not exactly following the one over x. Because right now it would no, like, no, 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 no. Like no, like all proteins would have no. zero. No, 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 okay. no, no. It's changing. So Sorry, uh, it's just a curve. We're I'm, I, I'm only talking about the functional shape. Now the next question here is, if you picked. A random subset of a zip. What do you see? What do you get? It's another zip. Curve. It's another zip. By the way, that is <laughs> stay with your with your Gaussian order. That's also true for the for the Gaussian. Um, so it's a zip. Okay. Now let's get back to where I wanted to imply that we have a method that predicts how many protein interaction sites I have in a protein. So, what do you possibly could use that for? After I discussed here the introduction of the zip flow, it was sort of a little bit of a distraction, but not quite. So, the, the interactions would look like a zip flow? Yes, so when, when you plot, essentially, uh, and I'm Half a zip is a zip. Pick a random point; it will be a zip. Uh, so ultimately, I, I don't. The number of protein-protein interactions per protein. So the number of protein interacting partners that a particular protein has will follow such a zip flow. Again, a scaling of this distribution. But the function of one over x will will essentially be the uh, a over x by the by something. Uh, and so this means that there are many, 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 many proteins who have very few interacting partners, and there are some proteins that have a lot of interacting partners. And these that have a lot of interacting partners are called hubs. So these are central points, and by the way, stations, uh, if you plot the size of train stations, is, is also zip. Uh, so hubs that in fact have a lot of interaction partners. Uh, the one famous one is P53 in human that is in fact involved in almost any cancer that we know about. Is one of those hubs, one of those proteins that is just crucial because it is some central junction point of, of a pathway. Uh, things go right or wrong and it is always involved. It's, anyway, uh, so the question is how could we predict or how could we use our prediction of the number of interacting sites. Can you repeat the question? So the question is this one here. So we have a prediction of interacting sites, right? How could I use this? I can use it to tell a user that a particular protein has an interaction site there, yes. But in the context of what we just discussed, what else could I do with it? Possibly. No idea? Uh, it's the idea of Jan Ayofan. Well, since somehow what we predict our method with, with our method is on the micro level. We predict whether a particular residue is involved in the protein protein action or not, right? Uh, so the more residues we predict, maybe the more binding partners on the macro level we have. So here we have a feature that is per residue. Here we have a feature that is per protein and has something to do with the network. When I predict that my that these five residues interact with another protein, I do not predict anything about a network. I don't predict the binding partner. I just say these five residues interact. But maybe there is a relation between this level, the micro level of a uh, set of residues is involved in protein protein interaction, and this one. Now, what's the problem in this idea? What, can, can you think about things where this will immediately go wrong? So I have a lot, yeah? Well, could use the same binding site for a lot Exactly. Of so we, we could have a protein. This is the protein that uses the same binding site for this and that. 
and many others, right? It's always the same binding site, and that will, does not mean more binding site. More, it's always the same, and still it binds to many partners, and these proteins exist. Uh, and in fact, so there's a dis distinction that uh, was introduced <coughs> by Marc Vidal, uh, the distinction into date and party hubs. So the date hub is exactly this kind of, of a hub where one protein interacts at the same binding site here with many others. While the party hub is the idea that in a party you're standing and you're talking to many people at the same time. So you're essentially interacting on many different, through many different places. Uh, so this would be a different type of hub. So there are things that interact with the same site and many, so go bind one, bind another, bind yet another, uh, and one is sort of simultaneously binding to many or could bind at many sites. So if that were true, then what we could get through our many uh, local residues predicted is of course the party hub, right? And that's somehow what we see, what I show uh, and that's some enrichment here, uh, is some overall curve where this one goes into more hotspots predicted uh, and this is uh, more of these hubs. Uh, this is none hubs in gray here, behind is the date hubs, it looks just like none hubs and this is party hubs. So there is some signal. I'm not saying this is the curve that I show you here, not at all, but there is some average thing, right? I can just predict locally something, a residue involved in a protein-protein interaction, and make an inference for the network level. Again, I don't see the network level on, on what I put into my input, what I see in my prediction, right? Uh, may not be very accurate, but it works. In fact, it's accurate enough, so uh, the, the person who initially did that, Yanai Ofran, um, then went ahead and tried to publish this. He couldn't. Um, and they told him that he, in fact, needs to support his publication with experiments. And 10 years later, he published it. Because he had the experiments and he got bumped up, but it took him 10 years to do all these experiments. Uh, and he turned from doing these experiments, in some sense, he turned from a computational biologist to a, an experimental biologist. Uh, by the way, he is just the same thing, not in, in, in a sort of pseudo three dimensional view, where you really see that the gray and the uh, purple here are on top of each other, while this one, the green one, the party hub looks very different. Uh